Frank and Lynn, I've got a really scary thing to do here. It says that I have to charge you. And I'm not sure whether that means I have to make a big bill that you have to pay me. I'm not sure if it means that I'm a soldier and we've got to go to war. And if that's the case, I'm bound to lose because you're a Maori warrior and I'm just a Pākehā and that's all over. So, so what I thought would do, I would do after having a little bit of fun with that is to, to try and see if we can change some images and some symbols here for a moment. And I need some of my friends in the congregation to help me with this. And, um, and I think it might help us get past this word, which is a fairly old-fashioned word in a way, but which has given me an excuse to say some things to you that I really want to say. I love the fact that Pastor Jerry gave us a bit of a reminder about the Old Testament and, uh, and then talked about how in the New Testament things were a bit different. So I'd like to pick up on that theme and, and mention a few really important things. In the Old Testament, the model about how people looked after other people spiritually was the model that we call priest. And we're all pretty familiar with that model. And there are still denominations today that use that word. And it's a rich and a precious word. And the New Testament doesn't do away with the word, but it really changes its meaning. And when we get to the New Testament, the writers say, you love those images of priests. Well, here's the good news. Every last person in the Christian family is a priest. And it would be really sad if we left this service today without reminding ourselves about that because that means that every last person here is really involved in this service. And they're involved in it because they're priests. That's what the Bible tells me. But the New Testament realised that we could all be priests, but the family might get a little bit ragged if, if we didn't, in fact, have some way of organising it. And it came up with a wonderful image. And in our tradition, this charge image is a bit like a warrior image. And I'm trying to move past that because I'm really scared that I would lose in any interaction like that. And I'd like to suggest another image for what's happening for you today. You see, the New Testament says everyone's a priest. And then it goes further and says everyone has gifts. And it lists them all. You know them. Heaps and heaps of gifts and everyone. Everyone here today has at least one, probably several of those gifts. But how is the work of God going to carry on unless we've got someone, and here's my really critical word, unless we've got someone who is a coach to help them really express their gifts. And that's what you are, Frank, and then you can both be this coach. And I like it a bit better than the charge image and the warrior image. It's a bit more at the heart of what I think the gospel is about. So what... Jesus is saying to you, and in my halting way I'm trying to say as well, is to tell you that I believe that you're called to be a coach and that means looking around over all the people and finding out what their gifts are and then sidling up beside them and saying, you can be a fantastic priest for Jesus if you know how to use that gift. I'll help you. That's your job. And the great thing is that this doesn't actually create a different status for us. This doesn't mean that somebody gets to lord it over anybody else. This means that gifted priests and coaches, we're all in this together. And there are people in our congregation who really understand that because they're doing that already. And I wanted to recognise them and affirm them and get them, in fact, probably to come up the front here and join us. I'd like all my... Th these people are all coaches. They're going to come down here now. We'll get you and Lynn to stand up again. But what about that? Coaches, come down here. Now, there's some coaches out in the, in the congregation too. 
and coaches or anyone who's doing this full time. Anyone who does this full time is in fact a coach. And there are some of some we've seen some of them. We have Paul here, but we have some other coaches out here. We really need to see them. We have Kendra and Kylie and Sarah, at least, who I know who are they're in full time ministry and they're coaches. And they really understand. In a way, it would be remiss of us not to gather around you and say, we really want you to take away the courage that you need to be a coach. And these people are all coaches. And they're really here to support and encourage you. And here's the thing. We, we want to tell you just something about what sometimes happens in the world of coaching in sports. In the world of sports, if a coach doesn't do too good a job for the all-black team, you know what's about to happen. It's sort of not too long left for the coach. Here's the great news, Frank and Lynn. In, when you coach for Jesus, you see, Jesus takes the long view. And these people all know about coaching and they know about the fact that sometimes it's just plain hard work and sometimes you feel as though you haven't actually made any progress at all. But here's the great news. Jesus has promised to be with you all the way. He's not there with his stopwatch out and the performance stats and saying, hmm, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist All Blacks under Frank's and Lynn's coaching didn't do too good. Maybe we should fire them. No, Jesus has promised to be with you through his spirit to say, hang on, brother, even when the going gets tough. Hang on, sister, even when you feel as though lots of people aren't real sure about your husband and may maybe think that he maybe should go somewhere else or that he's not effective. And that really cuts to the heart. Here's the good news. Jesus says, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. That's the best news any coach could get. So what I thought I would love to do, we've, uh, we've begun this ceremony, but I just felt like doing it again. And that was for, for all the coaches to really grip your hand and encourage you and say, we're with you, we understand, we know the fantastic joy when, 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 when your team wins, obviously wins. And there's some great ways in church like life when you obviously win. You win every time you baptise someone. You win every time you conduct a Christian marriage. Strangely, you even win when through the pain of a funeral you point people to the hope of everlasting life. But sometimes you feel that you lose. You lose if a teenager loses their way. You feel like you lose if somebody turns their heart away from Jesus. But we're here to encourage you, to shake your hand and to tell you with Jesus, you're not going to fail. And he has a crown of life that he wants to give you. He wants you to... to Get the feel of it even now, of the crease in your brow with that crown just about there. And when he comes again, a glorious crown that never fades away. So we want to encourage you both. We want to, again, once more to shake your hand, to wrap our arms around you as God's latest and God's really triumphant coach. God bless you. <laughs>